Mr. De La Cruz just ended a phone call, looking really happy. Using my skills, I moved over $10 million through four countries and 12 banks, successfully handling his funds and protecting him from government scrutiny. I'm Tony Cardone, known and respected for my expertise in moving money, hiding funds, and keeping people safe from legal issues. I don't ask where the money comes from, and I don't interfere with their business. To protect myself from legal issues and stay morally upright, I follow a simple rule. Don't ask questions to avoid being lied to. My work has earned me a good income. Using my strategies, I have 16 bank accounts in eight countries, 10 crypto wallets, and a company that manages my house, cars, bills, and expenses. I receive a $50,000 annual salary from the company, which I use for unexpected expenses. The company makes a small profit yearly to stay legal and protect me from civil suits, lawsuits, or divorces by showing minimal net worth and income. Many clients appreciate my value and offer me things I can't accept as thanks for solving their money problems, such as women, medicaments, trips, protection, and more. Until now, I haven't taken anything from them. My current situation requires me to accept help with surveillance, protection, and some force-related aspects. Business friends were glad to assist and thanked me for my work. My wife, Jen, sees me as a financial advisor, not knowing my earnings, funds, or offshore accounts. She knows the company covers our mortgage, cars, and expenses. She hasn't asked because she doesn't need to work, drives a new luxury car yearly, and has an unlimited budget for shopping and entertainment. I thought Jen was happy and loved being with me. Throughout our five-year marriage, we had satisfying and frequent closeness, making it feel like paradise. But apparently my paradise is about to face a Category 5 hurricane. Jen and I dated for two years, got married at 25, and have been married for five years. Jen just turned 30 with attractive features that make her a dream trophy wife. Blonde hair and amazing blue eyes can charm any man. Despite constant attention, she proudly displays her marital status. Before we married, I found out she dated a man named Josh Winters in college. She was madly in love with him, but he enlisted in the Marines, and their relationship eventually fizzled out. Now, I've learned that eight years later, Josh Winters left the military and came back to our city. Jen couldn't move on from her feelings for him. When Josh finished his two tours, he naturally reached out to old friends, including my wife. Jen had always been enchanted by him, and after getting her cell phone number from a mutual friend, he texted and called, trying to reconnect like in the past. Jen started acting differently about six weeks ago, probably feeling guilty about her secret communication with Josh. She engaged in excessive attention and additional closeness activities with me, which was pleasant but unusual for Jen. Although she was always cheerful, it was evident from her actions that something had changed. I didn't wait and paid closer attention to Jen. During a weekend barbecue, a friend mentioned Josh, stating he was back in town. I inquired about when he returned, and it coincided with the changes I observed in Jen. The next day, I called a business friend, informed him of the situation, and mentioned I might need his help. He was excited to help me, considering the money I made for him and how I kept him out of trouble with the feds. I provided names and information, and he assured me they would contact me soon. Who knows what these guys do? However, they swiftly provided me with a four-inch dossier on Josh Winters, containing almost his entire life history, from a copy of his birth certificate to college records, family tree, and military records. I knew more about this guy than his own mother. I also received a daily printout of his text messages, including over 15 messages per day, to my wife. I was told not to ask where they got this information. Initially, the messages were friendly, what you'd expect from an old friend. However, after the first week, they became close. I was relieved to see Jen halt his advances, but after another week of his persistence, he managed to overcome the barriers, and she began to flirt back. My anger grew because I knew Jen still had feelings for him, and I sensed trouble ahead. After four weeks of flirting and texting, he convinced Jen to meet him for lunch. Shockingly, he even had the audacity to ask her to wear something handsome for him because he missed her so much. To my horror, she agreed and even asked if she should forget her underwear. My anger reached a level I hadn't felt in a long time, just like old times. I sought advice from my business partners on how to deal with this situation. 
we agreed it would be best for me to meet them face to face during their lunch, with someone nearby for protection if needed. We knew exactly when and where they would meet, thanks to my friend's surveillance group assisting me with this problem. Entering the restaurant, I found them in a secluded area. Jen wore a revealing dress with a low cut and no bra, making me furious again. They sat together in a private booth with their backs to the restaurant, looking pretty cozy. I noticed a man following me, whom I assumed was one of my bodyguards. Approaching their table, my wife and her friend looked at me when I greeted them casually and slid into the booth across from them. The large man who had been watching me now sat three tables away, looking at Jen with a friendly smile. I inquired if my wife would introduce me to her friend, sensing the tension in the air as I locked eyes with Jen. Josh appeared confused when he glanced at me, while my wife displayed a mix of shock and guilt. They continued sitting side by side, holding hands on the table. Once she realized the situation, she attempted to free her hand from Josh's grasp, but he held it tightly, giving me a knowing smirk that conveyed he wasn't backing down. My wife nervously introduced Josh as Josh Winters and gestured towards me, her husband Tony. I'd never seen her so uneasy. Josh seemed amused, maintaining a silent confidence as if to communicate, I've got your wife, and there's nothing you can do about it, buddy. Remaining composed, I addressed Jen, expressing my need to talk to her privately for a few minutes. I requested him to let her step away from the table. He reluctantly let go of her hand, allowing her to leave the booth. She stood up, clutching her purse to her chest, standing between Josh and me, appearing scared and worried. I took her hand and led her to the back of the restaurant towards the restrooms. Still nervous and feeling guilty about being caught with Josh, she walked quietly. Without saying a word, I pulled her into the empty men's room and started addressing the situation. I mentioned her lack of a bra and the revealing dress, expressing confusion and hurt about her apparent disrespect. She stood there, shedding tears without uttering a word. Then, I raised the hem of her dress to verify the absence of underwear. Seeing my expression change from horror to rage, she observed as I held the dress above her waist and turned her to face the mirror, forcing her to confront her reflection. I pointed out the lack of underwear, expressing my dissatisfaction with her dressing when I'm not around. She screamed, pulling her dress down to cover herself. She insisted, No, it's not what it looks like. I know it sounds bad, but I have a good explanation, and you will understand. I promise to explain. In a commanding and stern tone, unlike anything she had heard from me before, I spoke slowly, emphasizing every word. I communicated the need for a discussion and laid out the terms, making it clear that if she wanted any hope of remaining married, she needed to comply with my directives. Otherwise, our marriage would end immediately. You're going to grab your purse, walk out looking straight ahead without acknowledging your boyfriend. Go straight to your car, drive home, put on the coffee pot, and wait for me to come back. I'll be no more than 10 minutes late. Don't text or call your boyfriend or anyone until we talk. I'll talk to your boyfriend and explain why you had to leave. I noticed she avoided eye contact, probably feeling guilty about getting caught. And one more thing. When you arrive home, don't change your clothes, stay in this dress. Wait for me in the same way. If you don't follow my request, don't bother coming home tonight. I'll call you later and explain how things will develop from now on. Oh my God, what have I done? When Josh approached me, I was relieved to find out he was safe and no longer in the military, as I always worried about his well-being. Josh was my first love, and it took me a long time to get over him. Even though we went our separate ways after he left me years ago, and there was no longer any love between us, thoughts of him lingered. I am certain I love Tony, my life partner since we met. I would never want to lose him or cause him pain. That's why this situation is so challenging. Darn it. Josh started flirting and saying things he knew would provoke me. He had a way of making me feel like a schoolgirl and doing things against my will. I despised that I couldn't resist. I tried to push him away, but his persistent flirting and suggestive messages wore me down until I eventually agreed to meet him for lunch. Talking to him made me feel guilty and mean. I knew I shouldn't be doing this, and I should have told Tony about Josh's return and our conversation, but I kept it a secret, and the regret is overwhelming. Josh has a knack for making me feel connected to him. When he asked me to wear something handsome, I agreed, knowing it was wrong, 
and that I shouldn't even be going to lunch with him, let alone wearing that dress. Yet I did it. What made me suggest going without underwear? Am I truly that shallow and foolish? Yes. When we dated, he always insisted I go without them. When he invited me to lunch, old memories flooded back, and it felt normal. I almost declined due to guilt, but a text from Josh saying he couldn't wait changed my course. It was tough not telling Tony, but I thought one dinner for old times' sake wouldn't be a big deal. Just a couple of hours. Just like old times. Just like he said. Josh knew how to persuade me even when I resisted. To be honest, when I saw him in the restaurant, I felt a certain desire. Our chemistry was special, and now he looked even prettier than I remembered. Eight years in the Marine Corps sculpted muscles that any woman would admire. My face turned red as he kissed me and helped me into a private booth. It felt like old times. Laughter, happiness, and excitement. When he held my hand on the table, I felt safe and warm. We were there for just a few minutes, laughing and enjoying ourselves, when out of nowhere, Tony appeared in front of us. Suddenly, he sat down right in front of us with a sadistic smile, sending a chill down my spine. My heart stopped as I realized the gravity of my actions. When Tony saw us holding hands, my world crumbled. I saw pain and anger in his eyes, and I wanted to jump over the table, hug him, and tell him how much I loved him, easing his pain. I could never intentionally hurt Tony, but that's exactly what happened. The way he looked at me with disgust and contempt shattered my heart. The man I love, who I've been with for the last five years, saw me with another man, an old flame. I was paralyzed and speechless, not knowing what to do. When Tony said he wanted to talk, my heart sank, anticipating the end of our relationship. As he pulled me into the men's room, I didn't know what to expect. When he lifted my dress to reveal I wasn't wearing underwear, I nearly fainted. I can only imagine what he was thinking. In that moment, I felt like a fallen and unfaithful wife. When he told me to go home and wait for him, the gravity of his words scared me. I knew I had to listen to save our marriage and make him understand why I did this. I need to fix this and agree with whatever he says. When he mentioned talking to Josh alone, I got worried for Tony. Josh is much bigger and has eight years of marine training. I feared Tony might get hurt. I wanted to tell him not to do it, but I felt confused. I tried to apologize, but Tony insisted I go home, saying he would be there soon. When he told me not to change clothes, I realized I was in trouble, and explaining my actions would be difficult. How did I let Josh convince me to do this? I didn't want him in my life, I just wanted to reminisce and have some fun. From Tony's perspective, though, I looked like I was about to have bed life with Josh. Darn it. How can I fix this? I felt like everyone was watching me as I walked to my car. I didn't dare look at Josh, and I knew he wondered where I was going. It took a few minutes before I stopped crying enough to drive home. It felt like the longest trip ever. Seeing pain in Tony's eyes made me cry again. How could I do this to him? I can't believe I let Josh manipulate me like that. Now I have to make Tony understand and forgive me. Darn, I'm in such a mess. All because of Josh and my stupidity. When I got home I made coffee and wondered about their conversation. How long before Tony comes home? Will he be angry? Can I salvage our marriage? I need to. I don't want to live without Tony. And he must know he's the only one I love. I went back to the table and talked to Josh. Well, it seems Jen won't be returning and I just wanted to talk to you. You must know she still has feelings for you and is easily manipulated, as you've seen today and over the past few weeks. But understand, she's married to me and I won't share her. I'm not possessive or reckless. Today, I decided to give Jen a choice. Either stay in our marriage or leave me for him, but not both. She would decide without his influence. I expressed that if she chose him, so be it. However, if she wanted to stay, she would have to cut contact with him. I made it clear that if he didn't hear from her today, he shouldn't call or text again. I emphasized that she was a grown woman making her own decisions and didn't belong to him. He confidently asserted that she would be with him again, claiming she couldn't resist their past with the same smirk. In response, I addressed Josh, expressing hope that he would be reasonable. I acknowledged his attractiveness and size, suggesting there were plenty of single women interested in him. I questioned why individuals like him couldn't leave married women alone. I proceeded to reveal my knowledge about him and his life, mentioning details such as his parents' names, the love for their dogs, the duration since he last saw his sister in Austin, 
and his best friend Billy's girlfriend being pregnant with a boy. I pointed out his persistence in text messages to Jen and warned him that my work friends, who owed me a lot, were ruthless. I challenged him, stating that tonight would determine who the better man was. I mentioned my willingness to be objective and respect her choice, even if she picked him. I asserted that I wouldn't live with a woman who desired another man and wouldn't share her. Although it would be painful, I preferred to let her go and move on. In the event that she chose to remain faithful, I outlined that there would be changes. Both of them had damaged my trust, and it needed to be rebuilt. I informed him that if she stayed with me, he would have no more contact, no texts, emails, calls, or reaching out to friends. He would vanish from her life. If you happen to see her in a restaurant, turn and walk away. At a party or club, leave if you spot her. Don't try anything behind my back or contact her, as the pain you'll feel will be beyond anything you've experienced. Your loved ones will pay for your stupidity. Do you understand what I said? Do you grasp how serious I am? Josh sat there, stunned, not knowing what to think. How do you know so much about my family and my life? Like I said, I have friends who owe me favors, and they're not people you want to get involved with. I might seem meek, but there's more to me than meets the eye. Are you really going to offer her a chance to leave you for me? I keep my word. Yes. If she were any other woman who disrespected me like today, I'd have kicked her out. But I love her, and I'll give her one chance. If you're right and she can't resist you, by midnight, she'll contact you. The other choice is to forget you, keep my vows, and remain her faithful husband. If she stays, you'll be dead to her. No more interference in our marriage. Josh expressed his belief that I should keep my word about letting them live in peace because, according to him, she would want to be with him. He claimed she had told him as much and emphasized how much she desired him, attempting to sound confident. His fooliness made me wonder if there was any truth to his words, a question that would be answered soon. As I left, the man in the shadows stood up, cast an angry look at Josh, and then departed. A minute after my departure, Josh received a message indicating that I had a bodyguard, challenging the assumption that I was an innocent, meek husband. While driving home, I pondered whether the woman I loved would ever be in my bed again. I questioned whether she would choose him and leave me or remain true to her vows. Upon entering the house, the atmosphere was quiet. She sat nervously at the kitchen table, tears in her eyes. Pouring myself coffee, I took a seat across from her. I addressed Jen, stating that I knew everything, including her texts, to Josh. I mentioned having friends in my business who owed me favors, individuals she would prefer not to meet. Despite her apologies, I conveyed that they were now meaningless. She had betrayed my love, and her actions that day had shown a level of disrespect for me as her husband that I had never anticipated. You know me, and I've made it clear that I won't tolerate living with a woman who doesn't respect me, our vows, and the sanctity of our marriage. In my world, cheating extends beyond the physical. Even the mere thought of being with another man is a betrayal. Actions such as engaging in conversations with Josh, wearing a provocative dress without a bra, suggesting not wearing underwear, all of these are considered lies. The act of sitting together and holding hands, especially in my eyes, constitutes treason. Collectively, these actions indicate that you gave your love to a man outside our marriage. Admittedly, there was no kissing, which is the sole reason we are still having this conversation. However, I want to make it clear that I will never share you, and I won't tolerate a cheating wife. I know you were close to Josh, and I understand you still have feelings for him. However, you're married to me, and I won't share you with him or anyone else. I haven't asked you to leave because I love you deeply and will do anything to keep us together. Before we continue, I have a question. Don't lie, I might already know. While sitting with him without underwear, did he touch you? Has anyone else in our marriage touched you there? No, I swear never, only you. Today, she was willing to let him. I questioned her, and she lowered her head, crying, apologizing for her actions. She expressed regret and asked for forgiveness. I acknowledged that, apart from a few handshakes and text messages, nothing had happened to end our marriage. However, I expressed disappointment and questioned her choice of dress, asking if she had planned to seduce him and get him into bed. She denied any intention of sleeping with him, explaining that she wanted to look handsome for him and relive old feelings. 
Despite understanding her past feelings for Josh, I emphasized that I would never share her with another man and presented her with a choice. I laid out the options. She could choose between Josh and our marriage. If she wanted to be with him, I would let her go, ensuring a fair divorce and safety for both. On the other hand, she could stay in our marriage, remain faithful, and honor our vows. I made it clear that if she chose Josh, she would need to leave the house by the weekend, and I would initiate divorce proceedings. If she chose to stay married, she would have to cut all ties with Josh. I emphasized the gravity of her decision and left her with the ultimatum, stating that she had a get-out-of-jail card but needed to choose wisely. I then left the kitchen, instructing her to sit and think about it. I conveyed that if she chose Josh, I would ask her to leave the house with her belongings by the weekend, initiating divorce proceedings immediately. I made it clear that if she wanted to stay married, she could not be involved with Josh again, emphasizing that he would be dead to her. I reiterated the same demands I had communicated to Josh, ensuring that there should be no possibility of them being in the same place at the same time. She agreed without hesitation. Before leaving the kitchen, I emphasized the gravity of her choice, presenting it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I instructed her to choose between her ex-lover and her loving husband, stating that I needed an answer when I returned from the shower. As I left the kitchen, she spontaneously declared, Of course I choose you, honey. I love you and don't want anyone else. Despite hearing her words, I insisted that she sit and think about it carefully. If we were to stay married, she would need to rebuild the trust we once had, and help me overcome the pain and anger she had caused. I stressed the difficulty of this task and urged her to give me her answer after I returned from the shower. Considering her actions and feelings for Josh, I emphasized that this decision was too significant for her to make without deep inner reflection. After taking my time showering and getting dressed, I returned to the kitchen. She ran up to me, expressing love and remorse, promising never to leave me and vowing to be the perfect wife. She declared her desire to have my children and pleaded for me not to leave her, emphasizing that I was the only man in her life. We shared moments of kissing and hugging, and then I carried her to our bed, feeling a sense of having my wife back. Fueled by anger, my actions led to a closeness encounter with this beautiful woman who willingly surrendered herself to me. She expressed love, urging me to take her, pulling me closer and kissing me tenderly. We shared a prolonged moment of closeness, reaching emotional highs together. Afterward, we silently embraced for an hour, feeling a sense of reconnection as the world around us faded away. We embraced the roles of husband and wife again, confident that nothing would ever come between us. The following day Josh concluded, She didn't call me, so I guess she decided to stay with this idiot. I can't believe this. Our connection and her actions made me think she would want to stay with me. If I could have gotten her into bed that day, she would have left Tony in a heartbeat. As soon as I can do this, she will be mine again. Her husband really messed up my plans. Who is this guy, and how does he know so much about me and my family? Well, I'm not done yet, and I think I can get her back. Sorry, Tony, but you're going to lose this girl. A few days later, idiot. Josh finally texted Jen, trying to convince her to leave me and be with him, which didn't surprise me. The good news was that Jenna showed me the text message and didn't respond to it. I told her I had already seen his message and was glad she didn't respond. Showing me the text was a smart step towards repairing our trust issues. The following day, I sent a text to Josh, inquiring about his parents' success in finding Casey and Mickey. Josh promptly called his parents, learning about their distress upon discovering the dogs were missing. He realized that his involvement with Jen had hurt his parents, despite Tony's previous warning. To emphasize the seriousness of the situation, I made the dogs disappear for a few days under close supervision after Tony's warning. Josh called me back immediately after speaking with his parents, expressing anger and concern. He demanded to know what I had done and issued a threat, stating that if the dogs weren't alive, he would do bad things to me. I responded by reminding him of my earlier warning not to mess with Jen, and emphasizing the pain he would feel if he got involved with her. I assured him it was just a temporary disruption and that the dogs would be back soon. However, I made it clear that this was his final warning and insisted that he never contact Jen again. Josh acknowledged the warning but stressed that the dogs better come back in good shape 
since he had ignored my earlier instructions. I declared my intention to take whatever actions I deemed necessary, and Josh would have to face the consequences. In response to his threat, I informed him that the return of the dogs was uncertain, as his tone did not inspire mercy. I contemplated whether they would come back at all, emphasizing his disrespectful tone. I suggested that perhaps his parents should know the reason their puppies had gone missing, teasing the idea of calling them. Josh, realizing the severity of the situation, apologized and pleaded for the return of the dogs, promising to stay away. I accepted his apology, but warned that next time, it wouldn't be the dogs disappearing. He agreed to stay out of Jen's life, and I assured him that the dogs would be back soon. However, I reminded him of my physical distance and lack of control over everything, stating that the people involved had their own opinions. I promised to discuss the matter with them and see what could be done. I expressed my hope that we wouldn't need to have another conversation, warning Josh that if we did, he would be dealing with much more significant issues. At three o'clock the next night, Josh's parents experienced tears of joy upon the return of their beloved dogs who were barking on their porch. Unaware of what had transpired and that their son had been involved, they felt immense relief. Josh, upon hearing the news, expressed relief at the return of the dogs and sent me a brief thank you message. Subsequently, he grasped the gravity of the situation, distanced himself from Jen, and secured a job in another city several hours away. Despite attempting to gather more information about me, Josh could only access public details, indicating that I worked as a financial advisor. Realizing that additional information was sealed, he decided to move on and start a new life, severing ties with his old flame. Concerned about the possibility of Josh re-entering her life, I took proactive measures. Two weeks after the incident, I presented Jen with a postnuptial agreement, drafted by my lawyer. The agreement outlined her willingness to relinquish everything, including rights to any children born during our marriage in the event of infidelity. While it couldn't prevent a recurrence of her previous encounter with Josh, it provided ample incentive for her to consider the consequences, given my increased attention and the knowledge that I would consistently check in on her. Alongside the post-nuptial agreement, we faced any potential challenges that lay ahead. Approximately a year later, Jen became pregnant with their first child, and the couple grew closer than ever. Recognizing the close call that nearly jeopardized her life, Jen committed herself to making me happy and strengthening our family. The specter of Josh gradually faded, and it seemed as if he had never existed. Despite the potential for irreparable damage in a single day, my love and approach towards challenges played a pivotal role in saving our marriage.